All right, it's time for us to turn boxing, and I'm delighted to say we're talking about this. It's an astonishing new work. It's simply titled Ali, A Life, and uh, it's anything but simple in terms of the vast scale of work that clearly went into it, but also of the achievement, I guess, in capturing the uh, full 360 degrees of Muhammad Ali's life. And um, I'm delighted to say Jonathan Ike is on Skype for us. Uh, Jonathan, congratulations. It's a, it really is a, an astonishing feat to be able to capture a life as as big and as well known publicly as uh, Muhammad Ali's and yet to still be capable of uncovering new aspects of it. Um, so congratulations. Thank you, appreciate it. It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun too. Yeah, so one of the things that we were talking about in the office that was kind of um, the, certainly one of the most interesting uh, rhythms that is in the book is the women in Muhammad Ali's life and uh, it turns out there were a lot of them. Yeah, there were a lot. I would hate to have to try to estimate how many. Um, you know, he was married four times, and um, most of those wives put up with uh, a lot of mistresses and knew about it um, as they were going through the, their marriages. It was something that they they had to tolerate or were expected to tolerate and, and did. Um, Ali was, was terrible, um, ran around with women all the time, often um, had his wives book hotel rooms for his mistresses, and would sleep with uh, with prostitutes sometimes right before his fights, even you know hours before his fights. It seems as if, in looking at this years later and, and um, reflecting on their role in it, and uh, I guess uh, maybe their role in it is, is their understanding of what that relationship was like. Some of them kind of seem to accept that, and others feel like they were taken for granted and. Uh, actually didn't fully appreciate what was going on at the time. Yeah, I think it was a combination of those things. They they knew what was going on and they felt like for a while they were able to accept it. They felt like they were the ones who counted that, that these other women were just sort of passing fancies for Ali and that he really needed his wives and, and counted on them to, to be there for him. And they were young and they were immature and they thought that, um, you know, they could put up with it. and. In the end, it, it became too much to bear for, for his uh, second and third wives, uh, the ones I interviewed the most, um, Belinda and uh, Veronica. They felt like they just were being taken advantage of after a while, that uh, there was no end to it, that the women, the, uh, the mistresses just kept coming and coming, and they, they couldn't take it anymore after a while. What kind of life do those women lead after they break up with Muhammad Ali because I guess that's the other picture of this it's a, it, as I said it's a full 360 degrees of, of what Ali's life is like how was life like for them um you know it, it varied they um they got nice settlements in the divorce they received a fair bit of money um but his second wife ended up um pretty much burning through all that money and and struggled for a while she was cleaning homes um in Ali's own neighborhood for a while she was working as a housekeeper um, his third wife ended up going back to school and, and, and becoming a psychologist and doing pretty well for herself. They, they all had kids of Ali's to take care of, and they, um, they looked after those kids and, and did a good job as parents, as best I can tell. And um, it was a difficult life, though, and I think adjusting to life after marriage to Ali was, was not easy. You know, you, uh, you go from being the center of the universe, um, uh, you know, married to the most famous man on earth. It's hard to get back to, uh, to adjust to a normal life after that. There's one aspect, I guess, that we should really focus on. We can't leave this discussion of the women in Ali's life without reflecting on it properly. Um, Muhammad Ali was violent towards the women in his life at various occasions. I know certainly in the Hauser biography there would have been a reference maybe once, but it seemed like that was kind of a, an event that was out of time. Um, here you get a, a complete picture that this was a fairly regular occurrence. I don't know that I would say it was a regular occurrence, but it did happen more than once. Um, his second wife told me of a couple of instances where um, where where she was hit, and um, third wife Veronica told me that um, she was not surprised to hear that that Ali could, especially before fights, uh, could become very um, uptight and and would lash out at the women around him. Um, it was definitely something that was hard for me to uh, to hear, given that you know I grew up as a big fan of this guy, and, and that behavior was um, was really difficult for me to believe and to accept. But it's uh, it's out there. It's part of what uh, these women testify to, and and we have to um, we you know we have to assume that they're telling the truth.
Jonathan, we can speak about the adultery that occurs in Ali's marriages, but then there's the element of manipulation as well. You've already alluded to the whole idea of booking hotel rooms and things like that. It didn't seem just like something that Ali did out of convenience. It seemed he got some sort of enjoyment out of that about having control of his partner because you quote him in the first divorce proceedings after his first marriage ends and he says he would like to marry a 17 or an 18-year-old girl next, somebody that he can mould into his way of thinking. He essentially gets that despite a pretty stubborn start with Belinda in his second relationship or his second real relationship. And it seems that this is something in a very perverse way that Ali really enjoyed having this control over these women. Yeah, that was um, interesting and, and troubling. And I think you have to look at some of the context. You know, he, he comes from an abusive household where his father was very domineering and, and, and um, drank heavily and beat his wife. And then he gets involved with the Nation of Islam, which has this attitude that men are superior to women and, and women are meant just to serve their their spouses and even says that you know men can have more than one wife uh, even though American custom frowns on that American law frowns on that uh, the nation of Islam sort of quietly says that um, it's okay to have your own harem and Ali becomes a part of this culture um, and and um, and seems to accept the idea or believe that he can be, um, controlling of these women in that way, and that that he you know in, in marries a very young woman in part for that reason that he wants to be in command, and um, you know for a guy who's the heavyweight champion of the world who's so big and strong he shouldn't need to, um, to 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 control women that way, but he has a hard time accepting them as his equal, I guess. Once you get four hundred pages into the book, it's chapter forty three, and it's an incredible few paragraphs here. You essentially just so concisely list off all these events that happen in Ali's life, regardless of what time these happen, like uh, women coming to the door of Ali's house saying that they're the mother of his children, and this happens a number of times. What I'll question, though, is the uh, story about Tamika Williams claiming she began an affair with Ali uh, in 75 and soon after had his son. Williams then later sued Ali for sexual assault, alleging that she had only been 12 when the relationship started. But of course, this statute of limitations kind of limited any of that actually getting to court or Ali being pressed with charges here. Like, that's an incredibly disturbing thing and not something that I'd come across before. No, you know, it was reported a little bit at the time when the suit was filed here in the United States. Um, a few publications mentioned it, but then the, uh, the the case was dismissed, as you said, for statute of limitations, so it was never fully explored. And uh, Tamika Williams is now deceased, so I was not able to interview her. And um, we don't know for certain uh, whether the child in question really was Ali's. Um, Ali's third wife, Veronica, had her doubts about it. Um, when I interviewed her, she said she knew about Tamika. She knew that she was somebody who hung around the camp a lot and um, may have slept with a number of people in Ali's entourage. Um, but she said she did not believe that the child was Ali's. Nevertheless, if Ali was uh, involved with a girl um, uh, who was a minor, that um, is, you know is, is obviously beyond disturbing. It's uh, it's criminal, and uh, we just um, you know it's uh, it's uh, it's it raises very un. un unsightly questions. When you, you, you talk about some of those questions, um, there's also FBI files that maybe have not been published before as well. How, how much of this was the FBI aware of, or were they specifically really interested in his links with the Nation of Islam and, and less his, his extracurricular activities? The FBI did not seem at all interested in his extracurriculars. You know, they used the F the FBI used uh, those kinds of uh, sexual um, allegations to try to take down people like Martin Luther King Jr., where they were trying to disgrace uh, King, uh, and they, they they made tapes of his bedroom activities. But with Ali, they did not see him as a threat to democracy. They weren't really that paranoid about Ali, and they weren't looking to discredit Ali. They were mostly interested in the Nation of Islam. And uh, they were, you know, they were concerned about people like Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. So they were keeping tabs on Ali for that reason, mostly. Um, they were also concerned that, uh, during his years of opposing the draft in Vietnam that um, if he were allowed to, um, to continue saying these things, that it might make recruiting more difficult for the military. But Ali was not um, spied on with that same level of intensity that, um, that other civil rights leaders were. That comes across in the papers as you kind of study them and, and read through them and kind of get access to, to this stuff. Again, I guess that, that gives us that 
better sense maybe than we've had before of of where his role was at the time and how he catapults himself from there to being the person who is considered the most famous and most successful and the greatest of them all in American culture at the end of the 20th century. It is a remarkable transformation. Yeah, it's stunning to think that somebody who was, you know, one of the most despised men in America in the 1960s can go to becoming this saint who, um, you know, seems to have almost universal acclaim and, and we all seem to want to um, see the best in him and, and see ourselves in him. He becomes, um, you know, this turnaround that he makes is, is fascinating. And, it, it, you know, some of it is, occurs just because he's, he's, he's struck with this illness and he's silenced and, and we, uh, we feel bad for him, I think. That's a big part of it. Another piece of uh, FBI information, Jonathan, is regarding one of Ali's former bodyguards, uh, Amir, who was murdered in 1965. So before the beating that led to his death, Amir told the FBI that Ali was getting tired of the numerous donations the Nation of Islam expected him to make. And according to one FBI memo, as you reveal in the book, uh, Amir told Ali he was foolish to let the Nation of Islam milk him. Now, remembering that this is in 1965, this is quite big information because it's fairly well known anyway into the 1970s. Ali becomes a more rounded person. He isn't this rebel. He isn't as devout, uh, we'll say, to the Nation of Islam, certainly after Elijah Muhammad's death as he had been in the 1960s. So to hear this coming from Ali in 1965, as early as that, is very, very interesting. And I'm just wondering, is, is this consistent with anything else or, or is it merely this bodyguard who, who was the sole uh, holder of this information? Well, there are suggestions that Ali had um, concerns about the Nation of Islam, that he was afraid that if he ever left, um, he might be killed the same way Malcolm X was, was killed um, after falling into a uh, you know, bad way with Elijah Muhammad. So, um, you know, Ali was a complicated guy. He was incredibly loyal to Elijah Muhammad. He, he believed that Elijah Muhammad was a prophet of God. He was willing to turn his back on, Elijah Muhammad, on uh, Malcolm X. Um, at a time when maybe he could have saved Malcolm's life, he, you know, he chose not to. Um, so it's hard to know how much of that was motivated by his true belief in Elijah Muhammad and how much of it was motivated by fear. I mean, a lot of us operate out of fear that God will, will strike us down um, if, we, if, we, uh, if we sin or if we disobey his commandments. And Ali truly believed that um, Elijah Muhammad was a messenger of God. So, you know, these, these things were really, um, were really tricky to... to to delineate and to just know exactly what he was thinking. But it was complicated and he was, um, you know, uh, he, he certainly had some doubts and some worries about, about the Nation of Islam. Those doubts, right, that seems to be the thing that has carried down through the years across history, that in some ways he was a victim of that arrangement. But what was he getting out of it? What, what did this man who clearly wanted to be a part of that organization and yet, as early as the mid-60s was resenting the amount of money that he had to give them, what did he feel like he was actually getting from that relationship? Was it s simply a, a pathway to God? Yeah, I think some of it was that he believed that this was a pathway to God, that this gave him an organizing set of principles in his life, just like a lot of people who, who find that religion gives them a sense of order, a, a, a way to live. The Nation of Islam suggested a way to live that, you know, if, if you... Uh, you didn't have to rely on the white man to um, to make the rules. You didn't have to wait for the white man to to give you um, a fair shot in, in this country, that you could fight for your own way of doing things. And eventually the Nation of Islam said that God would grant black people their own nation, like, you know, they would have their their land to themselves and they wouldn't have to uh, be a part of uh, white society anymore. So, so I think that a big part of it was that it gave him a set of operating principles in life, and um, and and it also you know gave him this identity of the of the rebel. It said you know he could be an outsider. He didn't have to be what people wanted him to be. He didn't have to be um, you know another Joe Lewis who just followed the rules. He um, he saw in this a chance to rebel. And does he use that? Like, is it is that a, a calculation on his part, or is it just a is it a more emotive thing? I think it's emotive. I don't think he's doing it um, in, in some way to boost his career or to make himself more famous. I think he believes that this is a way to make sense of life. And, you know, he, he struggles because he, he wants to be famous, but he also wants to, you know, punch white society in the face and say, you know, uh, I don't have to live the way you tell me to live anymore. So the Nation of Islam gives him a way to do that.
at the same time as that, though, Jonathan, you kind of very well illustrated in the book that he also wanted to be very, very famous. And with that comes acceptance. And I think there's a point in his career, as I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier on, that he realizes that being a little bit more kind to white society is what he needs to be if he wants to be as famous as he desires. And that point does arrive. And it's then we see this conflict between the guy he wants to rebel and the guy he wants to be extremely famous. Yeah, it's fascinating because uh, when he comes back after his um, his exile from boxing in the 1970s, he, he seems to just want to be a celebrity. He doesn't talk about race very much anymore. He doesn't talk as much about the nation of Islam. He starts doing television commercials for all kinds of products. He endorses his own line of uh, cologne and and, uh, and and linens for the bed and, and hamburgers. So... It's it's bizarre that a guy who wanted to be this this anti-establishment crusader all of a sudden also wants to endorse hamburgers, and and that's what makes Ali so fascinating. He wants to be the rebel, he wants to be the thorn in the side, and he wants to be loved, and those things are at war within him. If you could like turn time around and Muhammad Ali of say 1965 met Muhammad Ali of 1975, what would they say to one another in the trash talk beforehand? <laughs> I think the 1975 uh, version would be called an Uncle Tom yeah. by the 1965 version. You know, Ali would have said, "You're just a sellout. You're just out there um, making money. You're the white man's pawn. You're, you're, you know, you and Howard Cosell should go get married." You know, he'd he'd be uh, he'd be brutal. Uh, 65 Ali would uh, would uh, would would uh, tear apart the 75 Ali, tear him apart in the ring too. And yet, it's a 75 one who ends up being the platform for him to become so beloved by society. I wonder if maybe the 65 one has a bit of a point. Yeah, I think you can make that case because the 75 um, Ali is the one who's um, hamming it up with uh, with Johnny Carson and Howard Cosell and um, has you know kind of forgotten about his principles. He's no longer saying that white people will ne can never be trusted. He's saying, um, you know, white men can help my career. So it's... Uh, you know, you could call him a sellout or you could say that he just matured and mellowed, I guess. And understands the way of the world as well. There's obviously also um, clear details about the degenerative brain issues that he had and, and how early on in his career that people close to him, the doctors uh, in his camp, were beginning to notice that there was already an issue. And I think knowing everything we know now and knowing how the story ends for Muhammad Ali, that bit is incredibly poignant. Yeah, that was disturbing for me. You know, when I first interviewed um, Ferdy Pacheco, who was his ring doctor, Pacheco said that he thought he saw signs of brain damage as early as 1971. And I couldn't believe it. I thought he was mixed up, that he was, you know, mistaken about that. But I think he was right. I went back and, and first of all, I counted all the punches that struck Ali over the course of his career. And you can see that he starts getting hit a lot more in the 70s than he did in the 60s. And then I worked with scientists to study his speech rate, and you can see that his, his voice is starting to slow down, that he's starting to show signs of cognitive damage as early as 1970, 71. So um, it does appear that, um, that the punches were, were taking their toll and, and causing damage a lot sooner than, than people thought. Because even if you look back at Ali's earlier work and his own quotes that you quote here, like even after the Doug Jones fight, he's complaining about headaches and he says, maybe if we make enough personal appearances, we don't have to fight so much and get banged around. So it seems from even at that early point in his life, he's very aware that th there is this very real danger in his career. And then you illustrate that sliding doors moment when Warner Brothers offer him uh, a big uh, paycheck for I think Heaven Can Wait and Warren Beatty ends up casting himself in the role instead. It is a huge success. And as I say, it's this sliding doors moment and who knows what would have happened if he had taken that role. And most importantly, who knows how much longer Ali would have lived and certainly without Parkinson's symptoms. That's right. You know, he had lots of chances to get out. And, and I think every boxer knows that you're running a huge risk. You know, one punch can 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 leave you brain damaged. One punch can kill. Um, but he continued to fight because it was easy money or he thought it was easy money. Obviously, he paid a huge price for that money that he earned in the ring. You made the point earlier on about how anxious society has been to paint him as an angel after he gets injured and um, or after he gets his disease. and and that kind of sense that everything up to that point in some ways um, 
I, I want to use the word whitewash, it, it feels somehow like it uh, has racial implications. But that actually, that's what society really, that's the issue here in, in the Ali story, is that we, we haven't had this full sense of, there were a lot of awful things that happened in Muhammad Ali's life. He's a product of environments, and he was not immune from that environment. Uh, and to fully appreciate his life, or to understand his life, you really have to have all the details and, and understand that he is a complicated individual. That's right. You know, um, it's interesting to see what happens to Ali after he lights the Olympic torch in 1996, uh, because he's almost um, remade by the American society. For the for much of the 80s and 90s, Ali kind of disappeared. He, he wasn't the, the great hero. He was somebody you could hire for a few thousand dollars to sit at a trade show or come to your car dealership and sign autographs. And and he was damaged. He was, you know, he didn't look good on TV, and and he was, he didn't like to appear on TV. But then when he lit that Olympic torch in 1996 in Atlanta, um, it was as if the world rediscovered him, forgave him for everything he had done, and just wanted to hug him. But the reason that we wanted to hug him was because he was weak, and he was, and he was, he was silent, and he was, he was harmless. Um, but we need to remember that Ali was was not harmless. Uh, the reason he's important is because he was dangerous. And he was complicated. We shouldn't turn him into some kind of an angel. One of the, the final things here, Jonathan, just in terms of the comparisons you make with Ali, the Bob Dylan reference is very appropriate, really, because essentially Muhammad Ali and Bob Dylan are both products of the 1960s, but at the same time, they don't properly fit in until people from the 1960s are living their lives in the 1970s. I think the reference you make is that people would still dress up like hippies and go to the Bob Dylan gigs, but then the next morning they'd go back to their nine-to-five desk job. And it kind of feels to me that the 1970s was a decade that Muhammad Ali will kind of feel at home in the most. This is exactly where he belonged in history. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. You know, for so many of those great rebels who had to um, put their tie-dye T-shirts away and go out and, and, and you know, they were only 20-something when they, when they made their mark in the 60s, um, what do you do after that? How do you have a second act? How do you live the rest of your life as an adult without completely selling out the principles that, that made you famous and that you cared about the most in the 60s? And I think that, you know, Dylan and Ali and all the great um, rebels of the 60s had to struggle with that. What do you do when you grow up? How do you, you know, they mocked middle age. They said that they would never want to even be 40 years old. So how do you go on with your life? And Ali became an entertainer after that. Yeah, it's, a, as I said, an astonishing uh, book. Jonathan, thanks so much for making the time to talk to us, and congratulations again. Thank you. The book is called Ali, A Life, and uh, Jonathan Eig is its author there. I think it's going to be on a lot of people's Christmas card lists. I think so. It's actually a pretty good achievement if you manage to get through that at Christmas. It's a couple of weeks of good, solid work in there. There's Very good a, information. There's almost 100 pages of um, notes and yeah. index at the back of it as well. So Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like if you're a first-timer to Ali, it's got everything in there. It's very comprehensive. But at the same time, like I've read one or two of Hauser's books and I can't remember, Norma Mailer as well. And it, it kind of approaches all these things from a fresh angle with that new info as well from the FBI. And uh, as we discussed in depth, there is Love Life. It's uh, a very interesting book that kind of adds a bit of depth to what we already know. Hey, hope you enjoyed that latest offering from Off The Ball. If you want to subscribe, and you should, check out just up here. All our latest stuff is just down here. Generally, knock yourself out.